I want to share from the Bible, and uh, we can turn to our Bibles in the book of Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. God has healed quite a number of people in this place. It's not what the pastor says, but it's what God has said. And something about God is that his word is final. His word is truth. That's why the Bible says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. So when God says he will heal you, that is what he actually meant. That's why sometimes we can actually come to church and praise God and let him do it later. Praise is something that sets the stage. We enter into his courts with thanksgiving praise. We have been called to be a people who know who God is. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is the ever-living God. He is the God who says, I will show up when there is a need, when there is trouble. That's why the psalmist says, God is our present help in time of trouble. Sometimes you may be in a place of trouble, but what I want you to know is, there is a God who is going to show up. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. As you have heard, my name is Pastor Kevin Tindy, and this is the family month, and I was requested by our family pastor to share about mentorship. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. The Bible says, Train a child in the way he should go so that when he is old enough, he will not depart from it. Train a child the way he should go so that when he is old enough, he will not depart from it. The title of my sermon is The Need. Heavenly Father, we thank you for we can come to you at any time. You are the king who attends the meetings of your people. So Holy Spirit, we pray that you move in this place. We thank you. We will never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says, train a child in the way that he should go. The word train actually speaks of the notion of committing, commitment. It speaks about dedication. You dedicate yourself to train a child in the way that he should go so that when he or she is old enough, this child will never depart away from it. The word child, I did a research and I found out that the child is actually a child, it can be a lady, it can be a young man, it can be a youth or a young person. But then again, I believe that there's a child in every man. In as much as we advance from one level to another, we become a child in the next level that we have gone into. When you are in standard one and you go to standard two, you are promoted, but then you become a child in standard two, which means you will need to have someone who will train you in the ways that you should go. You should be trained by someone who will teach you in the ways of the Lord. In other words, what am I trying to say is that we are all children at, such a, at, at a particular point in life. The more we advance, the more we become a child. And Paul said, when I grew up, I put away childish things. So in the next level, you become a child, but as you grow, you put away childish things. One great psychologist said that 
human beings are deterministic. What he meant by that is that our behaviors, our feelings, our attitudes and values are determined by our childhood experiences and our upbringing. Whatever we go through in life, whether good or the bad experiences, we tend to push them in the subconscious mind. And then someone say that if you're not careful, your subconscious actually controls you. That's why you find some people are doing things and you're wondering what is happening. And they are believers. It's because their subconscious is controlling them. But how can we be able to help this is awareness. Another great psychologist said that behavior can be learned and learned and relearned. How can this behavior be learned and learned and relearned? In the environments that we are in, it can be in a family setting, it can be in a, in a, in a school setting, in the hostels, it can be in the bus. Where you are planted or where you are at, you pick up certain behaviors and you learn them. And if you go to another environment, you can relearn other behaviors. You can unlearn as well. Good behavior is actually hard to form but easy to live with. On the other side, bad behavior, they are easy to form and hard to live with. How can we form good behavior? By repetitively doing the good things, the good behavior over and over again as you override the bad behavior. From a Christian setting, I'm speaking about discipleship. But I don't want to speak about discipleship. I want to speak about mentorship because they are closely related. The Bible says, train a child in the way that he should go so that when he is old enough, he will not depart from it. According to the Wikipedia, mentorship is a relationship in which a more experienced or a more knowledgeable person helps to guide a less experienced in knowledge, in skills, and experience. It's more like walking side by side with someone. In other words, a mentor develops a protege. All throughout the Bible, I see people that were mentored people that had a relationship with someone who was more experienced, them being less experienced. And Jethro was a mentor to Moses. Moses is someone who had, who had been drawn out and he is someone who had gone through the issues of life and then God called him to lead 600,000 plus people from bondage. And after Moses led these people away from captivity, he is at a place that he is the only judge. He is taking, he is watching and looking after the affairs of the people, taking care of 600,000 people and there's no WhatsApp group, there's no Twitter, there's no Instagram. It's a challenge. And this is something that was weighing him down because he was doing so much, yet he was alone. How many of us are doing so much, yet we are alone? Train a child the way that he should go so that when he is old enough, he will not depart from it. And as a result of being mentored by Jethro, Moses mentors the 70 elders and his work was made easier. Moses me mentored a guy called Joshua and Joshua had already shown the potential and he was given the opportunity to learn and to develop as a leader. As long as you have been gifted, you become a leader in an area of influence. 
Eli mentored the young Samuel at a very young age on how to listen and to hear the voice of God for himself. It's so sad that many of us want to hear the voice of God through our pastors, through our CG leaders, through the people that God has placed above us. But something about mentorship is, mentorship will teach you on how, that, how you will depend on the voice of God for yourself. Elijah mentored Elisha. Jesus spent three and a half years with the disciples and he taught them, he advised them, he gave them guidance. And the results of being mentored, we see lives were changed. The 12 formed churches, the 12 turned cities upside down, the 12 have enabled us to be a people who are able to listen to the gospel today. Elisha performed many miracles. Joshua did amazing things. He conquered territories for the Lord. According to research, speaking of mentorship, it says 45% of unchurched youth identify the opportunity to receive advice from people with similar life experiences as very important. Again, 68% of churched youth identified the opportunity to receive advice from people with similar life experiences as very important. Both churched, the people who go to church and the people who don't go to church, they desire a maximum number of opportunities to connect with a mentor. The question will be, now that we know when you are trained in the ways you should go and everyone is a child, you will not depart from it. The question will be, how comes many people are not being taught on the way that they should go? How comes many people are not being mentored? How comes many people do things, you wonder, where did they learn this behavior from? I have two things that I will talk about. And the first one is social media. Research says that the population in our nation today is 52.7 million, and it is still growing. According to another research, it says that 43 million Kenyans have access to the internet. 86% of people on Twitter are actually from Nairobi. Another research says that every 4.3 minutes, someone touches their phone. We touch our phones every, uh, for, in a day for about 150 times. For those who are in school, there's a research that says young people spend 80% of their time on social media doing nothing that is related to their growth. We are all bathed into this thing called social media. It's like almost everyone in this place has a phone and they can connect to the internet. The world has about 7.7 .7 billion people and 4.3 people plus are connected on Facebook. In fact, someone said that Facebook is like the seventh continent where people go and communicate, people go and interact. But a funny thing and a sad thing is that many people are connected, yet people are, people are lonely. Now that we know about this, 
We know that we spend most of our times with our phones. Our phones are our travel companions. We use our phones to take pictures. We use our phones to make transactions. But something about our phones is like, it can be like a digital vampire that sucks away our time. Many of us, we go to bed late, we wake up early, we regret, and we still repeat the same, same thing. There's something called the highlight reel. As a result of spending most of your time on social media, there's a research that says it causes stressors. The highlight reel actually speaks of the collection of the best moments, the collection of moments of victories, the collections of achievements, and, and this is where you post a photo where you are looking great. You take more than 50 selfies so that you pick the best one, and then you put it. The highlight reel. These are things that we keep on doing on a daily basis. And someone say that we struggle with insecurity because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. Comparison as a result of spending most of our times on social media. Comparison because where we are at cannot match where other people are. Let me speak something about comparison. Comparison will make you not to focus on God. Comparison will make you to be someone who will not sit at the foot of Jesus. Comparison is something will make you to walk away from what God wants to do in your life. Comparison will draw you away from the plan that God has in your life. In fact, it will stop you from being mentored and being taught on the ways of the Lord so that when you are grown enough, it will not depart or you will not depart from it. Let me bring from the scriptural perspective. The Bible in the book of, of First Samuel, David had already killed Goliath, and David was the person who killed the bully, someone who, had, who, was, who was tempting and trying to torture these young, young people of Israel. And then it comes to a place that David actually kills him using a, a, a stone. And after David da did that, David is walking into Jerusalem with the head of this man that was, that was torturing and tempting the people of Israel. Israel. And when David entered into Jerusalem, women started singing and women were saying, Saul has killed thousands and David has killed tens of thousands. And as women were singing, they were singing and praising David. And then something called comparison came in and, and, and Saul, the king Saul at that time started comparing himself with David. And Saul, when he was comparing himself, he fixed his eyes on David. And that's why he said, I am going to kill this man. I am going to pin him to the wall. And I am going to, to, to erase him from the face of this earth. You see what comparison can do. Comparison will make you to stop focusing on the God-given plan, the God-given opportunity. Comparison will stop you from doing things that God has called you to be. Let me remind you, the cancer to comparison contentment is comparison. Many people are not living their God-given gifts, their God-given potential because of comparison. Be yourself because everyone else is taken. Many people are missing out their calls on God. Many people are entering into relationship because of comparison. Many people are taking loans because of comparison. Many people are doing things that are outside the will of God because of comparison. And I am here to take you out from the cancer ward. I am here to speak into your life and tell you that the cancer to contentment is comparison. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, stop comparing yourself. You are forbidden to be someone else. Be yourself because everyone else is taken. The highlight reel makes us to lose our focus. Yet God has called us to fix our eyes on the author and 
finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. But many of us are fixing their eyes on, on Kim Kardashian and, 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 and all these other musicians and people that don't make sense. People are fixing their eyes on people that are teaching them on how to dance, on how to do makeup, on how to dress. People are fixing their eyes on people who don't know the Bible. But the Bible says, teach me on the ways that I should go so that when I am grown enough, I will never depart from it. Give a shout of praise to Jesus. My second point is social currency. A currency is something that we use to attribute value to goods and services. In marketing, there's something called the economy of attention. This is where everything is competing for your attention. And when you give something a like or a piece of that finite attention, it becomes a recorded transaction attributing value. In other words, we attribute value to something when we see its worth. And in social media, it is translated into likes, shares, and comments. One of the reasons as to why we spend most of our times on social media is because we want affirmation from people. We want people to show us of how what we are. Instead of being trained, we are not being trained. Instead of being mentored, we are not being mentored. Let me ask us a question. Since almost everyone, I believe, has a phone, if you posted something on social media today, and then maybe like 30 minutes later, you checked and you found 300,000 likes, how would you feel? Oh, the people that are keeping quiet, they translate it into cash. <laughs> you will feel good. There's a substance called dopamine in our bodies. It makes you feel good that you would want to do it again and again and again. But on the flip side, what if you posted and then you only found three likes for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? <laughs> How would you feel? You will feel terrible. You will feel you're worthless. You will feel no one likes me. People don't actually appreciate me. In fact, when you even posted scripture, you will see even the pastor does not like me. <laughs> the highlight real. And as a result, in social media, I want us to know that we are the products. And you being the product, you want people to, to speak of you being worth. You get three likes, high possibility you will pull down the product from the shelf. The highlight, real. <laughs> Thank you. It's because I have uh, saw something. Yeah. Um, the highlight, real. And now that we know that these are stressors, could it be why people are depressed is because of one of the things is being on social media so much? Could it be the reason as to why people are entering into, into things that are not godly be as a result? Could it be people are anxious because of you post and then you're waiting for people to like? Could it be that some are even committing suicide because of social media?
The third stressor is FOMO. F O M O. How many of us know FOMO? Many of us actually don't know this. But it's good that today you're being trained on the way that you should go. <laughs> so that at the end of service you will not depart from it. FOMO is something called fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. Perhaps most of our or worst, the worst of our phone habits are birthed as a result of FOMO. FOMO is actually social anxiety that you are missing a potential connection that is happening somewhere else. That's why you find people are always on their phones. People are always on their phones. People are scrolling. I don't know what you're scrolling. People are just on their phones. You're speaking to someone and you're still on your phone. Fear of missing out. A research says that seven out of ten people, seven out of ten people would have uh, uh, done away with social media, but because of FOMO, they would rather not. And FOMO comes as a result of, of, of the hashtags that are trending, the, the viral trends and the movies and the series that are there. We fear missing out. There's a guy called Andy Crouch. He spent 40 days away from a phone, 40 days away from a laptop, anything, any gadget. And then at the end of the 40 days, he was asked, how was it? How was the experience? He said he feared missing out. But that was not even the main thing. The main thing was he feared affirmation. Remember, in social media, you are the product. This acronym, FOMO, was coined in the year 2004, according to research. But I want us to know where FOMO started. In our Bibles, in the book of Genesis chapter 3, God had already made man in his own image and God put him in the garden. And the garden is where the presence of God is. That is where you can eat pineapples, kiwi fruits. You can do a, a, a pudding and, and salad. I don't know whether they will have put yogurt in that place, but there was sugar cane and, and that time maybe you could put it in your food. And, and there was so much that these people would enjoy in the presence of God. And then the serpent came in. When the serpent came, went to Eve, and I'll paraphrase, the serpent told Eve, did God really say that you should not eat? The serpent told Eve, if you don't partake of this fruit, you will miss out to be like God. You will miss out to be like God. And this thing, since it started in the Garden of Eden, it has spread out like a wildfire. That's why you find today m most of the people are actually doing things because of fear of missing out. You find people are in forbidden relationships and they are pushing God away because they fear missing out. You find people taking loans because they fear missing out on buying a plot. You find people are, 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 are buying cars and buying expensive phones because they fear missing out. You find people are, are actually betting because they fear missing out. You find people are entering into marriages because they fear missing out. You find people are doing things that will lead them to a downward trend because they fear missing out. But I'm here to tell you today, God has called you to be someone who will be an outcast with people so that you will be an incast with God. God has called you to be someone who should not fear 
missing out. God has called you to be someone who will be like David while others are busy having sex, while others are busy betting and doing things that are, 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 have no good consequences. God is calling us to be a people who are working on our gifts. We are always working on our gifts. And David was someone who was throwing stones uh, to a lion and a bear. He was working on his gift and his gift was the one that took him before a, a great man and God is calling us. We should not fear missing out. In fact, let me introduce you to something new called Jomo. It's called the joy of missing out. We should, we should feel good when we miss out because we are not missing out on the things of God. We are missing out on the things of the world, but we are not missing out on the things of God. We are missing out on the things of the world so that we will enjoy the things that God has for us. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, Jomo, no more FOMO. It's time that we stop doing things that will drive us away from the presence of God. It's time that we start doing things that will keep us in check. It's time that we start to take delight in reading the Bible. It's time that we start to take delight in spending time with our families. It's time that we start enjoying watching things that will build us in our leadership, that will build us in our families, that will build us in our skills, that will build us in, in our all aspects of life. The joy of missing out is real inside in, 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 in as much as this thing is real, God is calling us to enjoy because you are an incast with God. You are not called to, start, to fit in. You are called to stand out. Something about FOMO. We should fear Missing out heaven. If there's something that you should fear missing out is heaven. From the Bible again, I'm taking you on a tour. If you go to the book of Luke chapter 16, there is a guy, Luke chapter 16 from verse 16. There is a, a, a story of two guys. One is the rich man and the other one is Lazarus. The rich man had everything that he could have in this world. Lazarus was eating the crumbs that would fall from the rich man's table. He missed out on everything that he could ever want. And when they died, the rich man who never missed out on everything went to hell. And Lazarus, who missed out everything, went to heaven. The thing that we should fear missing out is heaven. It's time that we open that door of FOMO and step into the new door of JOMO. FOMO on eternal life is what is worth losing sleep over for our families, our friends, and neighbors. Heaven is God's eternal response to all the formers in this life. My first point was social media, and my second point is family. with regards to our upbringings, sin came into the world and it destroyed the family structure. It destroyed how we are supposed to be mentored, how we are supposed to be trained on the ways of the Lord so that when we grow up, it will never depart from us. Looking at the first family, the Adam's family, we find after sin came in, Abel was killed. 
Fast forward. Look at the life of Jacob and Esau. Because of sin, favoritism reigned in the family. The mother started to favor Jacob, and the father favored Esau. Sometimes you may think that you're actually favoring and helping, but actually you're killing. Sometimes you may think you're helping the members of the family, the children, by favoring one, for, one to another, but you're killing the relationship. As a result, we find Jacob had to run away. You see what favoritism can do. And if we go up to the time of Joseph, Joseph, when he was blessing the children, he wanted to favor the other one. Some of us, because of our upbringings, and I'm not speaking against anyone, but I am all for us. I am just speaking what I have to speak. Some of us are raising their children in their own understanding. Some of us are raising their children in bitterness. Some of us are raising their children and they are speaking things that will destroy the child. Some of us are holding on to the children so much that they can't even release them to go to church. Some of us think that they are the only teachers that have on for, for, for their child. Some of us may be single parent families and you are raising your children and something that you are communicating subconsciously, you are speaking to them that all men are bad. How will this child grow? We have been called to be a people who should be mentored, who should be trained in the ways of the Lord. There were times where we could see women and, and women would meet with girls and, and the girls would, would come to women and they would be mentored on how to become women, on how to cook and how to, to present themselves in front of the man. But, uh, uh, and when it comes to the side of the, of the dads, dads during those times will go and, and do game and do whichever thing. But nowadays, high possibility we find women mentoring women, but men are lost in betting. Men are lost in the clubs. Men are lost doing things because the Bible says that the enemy is after the man. That's where you find the woman is actually trying to do everything. The woman is trying to juggle between being the father and the mother. And the truth is a woman can never teach a man to be a man. Men have to stand up. Men have to rise up and to teach men on how to be men. Some of us have been raised without parents and, and we are running around like headless chicken. Sometimes we may get a girl and we don't know how to make the next move and we let the girl go and we start regretting because there's no one who taught us on how to become a man. Some women have not been told on, or taught on how to become a woman so that you will present yourself in front of your boyfriend in a manner that is dignified. Teach us the way that we should go so that when we are grown enough, we will never depart from it. You may find a mother, a mother may raise up a child to become a doctor. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing when the child becomes, for those who are doctors. And as the, as, the, as the child becomes a doctor, the mother was raising this child subconsciously so that this child would fulfill the need of the mother who had an experience with a doctor that did something wrong. We find people are telling other people to do courses just because you had a bad experience with something, just because you missed out on something and now you are grown up. It doesn't mean that we should take that path. It doesn't mean that what did not work for you will not work for us. Just because you had a bad experience with a car, it doesn't mean that we should not buy that car. 
The thing is, most of us are advising other people from a point of brokenness, from a point of bitterness and anger and hatred and jealousy because you see someone wants to buy a car and you want to bring them down. Most of us are doing all these things and sometimes it's subconsciously, but God is saying we should be a people that should advise people from a point of holiness, from a point where there is scripture, from a point that you will teach people on the way that they should go so that when they are grown enough, they will be dependent on depending on the word of God. They will know the voice of God for themselves. They will know God wants me to be a doctor. They will know God wants me to be a nurse. They will know God has called me into this place just because you're married. It doesn't mean that when we are single, we are deficient. It means that God is at work in us and he is teaching us to be sufficient and complete Lead in him. Give Jesus praise. God is calling us to be a people that will raise other people not from a point of brokenness, but from a point of holiness. Let me encourage the people that are in this place, you may be a single mother, you may be a single father, you may have gone through a long time and you were still as single as a mango seed, but I am here to remind you, you may be here and you have been trusting God for a job and every time you try to get a job, you don't get a job. You have been struggling with sickness. Let me remind, remind you something. The book of Hebrews chapter 12 says, now there Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we are surrounded by people who have been through what you're going through. And these people, as you sit at their feet, these are people that will advise you from holiness. These are people that will encourage you. They may say you may be a single mother, but keep on moving. You may be a single father, but keep on moving. You may not have a job, but God is going to provide for you. You may not have school fees, but God is going to open doors. You may not, you may not have someone who will date you, but God is saying that I will bring someone for you. Keep on trusting. Keep on believing. Keep on walking. Even when you can't walk, you can't crawl. Even when you can't run, you can still lie on the floor. And God is saying that you are surrounded. If you don't have someone who will train you, remember Jesus is the one that will train you. You may be an orphan. You don't have someone. But Jesus is saying today, I will will train you on the way you should go. I will train you and show you that I am your father. I am your mother. I am your provider. I am your healer. I am your friend. In fact, I will stick closer than other people. I am your deliverer. I am Jehovah Shammah. Teach us on the way we should go. So that when we are grown, we will not depart from it. I want us to pray. I want us to pray. I want us to pray and in your own words, just start worshiping God. The atmosphere is set in this place. Just worship God. Just worship God. Just worship God. Even if you have nothing to say, tell him, Father, I am here in your presence. Just worship God. Just worship God. Just worship God. I want you to know that you are not alone. I want you to know that you are surrounded. I want you to know that the God who has brought you here, he will take you through it. He will take you to places of honor. He will do that which concerns you. He will do that which is exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask or think. The God that we serve in the, is in this place and he is saying, I am here for you. You may never know how to make the next step, but I will train you on how to 
make your next step. You may never know where your rent money is going to come, but I will provide for you. You may never know. Doctors may have given up on you, but God is saying this is the day that I am teaching you the way that you should go, the way of healing, the way of restoration, the way of provision, the way that I will do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask. Have your moment with God. Have your moment with God. Have your moment with God. Have your moment with God, church. You're here and you're saying, Lord, I want to give my life to you. You're saying, Lord, I'm here. I may be broken. I may be wounded. But I want to give my life to you. Just lift up your hand. Just lift up your hand. This is your day. This is your day. Just lift up your hand. This is your day. You are saying, Lord, I want to be part of your family. Thank you for that hand. Just lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. I don't want this moment to pass you by. I don't want this moment to pass you by. Just raise it up high so that I can see it. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, oh God. We thank you, King. Oh, thank you for that other hand. We thank you, King of glory, King of majesty. Thank you for that other hand. Exalt the Lord. Exalt the Lord in this place. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy, O God. You are holy and you are awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that other hand. You are great. You are wonderful. You are glorious. Father, there is no king like you. Just lift up your hand. Just lift up your hand. Thank you for that other hand. Just lift up your hand. Just lift up your hand. I don't want this day to pass you by. I don't want this place, this day to pass you by. This is the day that you enter the joy of missing out because you are in Christ. Just raise up your hand so that we can see it. Just raise up your hand, raise up your hand. Thank you for those hands. 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 Thank you for those hands that have been raised. Thank you, thank you. You still want to give your life, just lift up your hand. Don't let this moment pass you by. 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 Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Still with our heads bowed, I just want you to repeat this prayer. There's someone at the back there who has raised up her hand. Thank you for those hands. Thank you, Jesus. King of glory, we exalt your name. I just want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord God, Today I come to you. Today I declare that the old has gone and the new has come. I am a child of the Most High God. Thank you for accepting me into your family. Thank you for I am a new creature. Thank you for that you love me. Surround me with your truth. I pray that you train me on the ways that I should go. Thank you, Jesus. Let us celebrate the Lord. Let us celebrate the Lord. Let us celebrate the Lord. Amen. Let's give him a round of applause again. That was so wonderful.